Thank you all. Uh, we're here with our next talk. Uh, our next speaker is a science director at IndieBio, the world's largest biotech accelerator. She is a PhD in chemical biology and is passionate about using the intersection of biology, tech, and design to increasing human health span. Now here to present her talk on the brave new world of bio-entrepreneurship, ladies and gentlemen, June Oxup. Right, thank you so much, and thank you for the organizers for having me. Um, so I'm going to talk about bio-entrepreneurship. Um, and of course, when we think of entrepreneurship today, a lot of times we think of our Facebooks and Googles and Ubers, um, and we think of tech entrepreneurship. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of biology startups coming out of kind of garage labs yet. And a lot of that, there's a bunch of reasons for that. But let's take a look a little bit, step back and take a look. Even in the tech sector in the last couple of years, uh, or decades, um, we've seen that it actually came out of academia with ARPA and a conglomerate of different academic labs. And the first companies that came out were actually corporations. Um, a lot of these companies were infrastructural companies, you know, your IBMs, your Ciscos, that built up the, the hardware and the communication pipeline for that. And then, of course, we started entering kind of the hacker space where code has started to become open source, the technology is becoming cheaper and cheaper, and that really drove people to start companies. Um, you have your you know, kids in a garage who are now coding and, and the, the software and hardware is so cheap that they can start making and testing their ideas. And we actually do see this similar route in biotech entrepreneurship, although even today have, the majority of what we see is heavily in academia still. And of course, we know all our big corporations, your big pharma companies, your Genentechs, your Pfizer's, um, those have been traditionally what we think of biotech. Um, and those usually come out of academic labs with lots and lots of money um, and, and lots of VC backing in order to even get started because biotechnology is so expensive. But as we know, in the last couple of years, we also started seeing biohackers. Um, so we have community labs like BioCurious, counterculture labs, um, and of course, um, you know, the interest of biohacking is, is um, increasing and people are starting to think about how do we open source a lot of the methods that we, we've learned, how do we make equipment um, cheaper, how do, we, um, how do we find reagents and things cheaper as well. And that really kind of leveraged, that, leveraging on that, we've started seeing entrepreneurship happening in biotechnology, which is really exciting, and we're still in very, very early days. Um, however, there are some differences between biotech startup entrepreneurship and tech entrepreneurship, is that in tech, we had the microchip, which with this one chip, we were able to read, write code, we're able to copy, cut, paste, do all these different functions on this one chip. And this chip, of course, with Moore's Law over time, has gotten ridiculous, ridiculously cheap, now that everyone has one in their, in their pockets. And that has not been the case for biotech. Biotech, each little bit of function took many, many years to, to put together. So in the you know, 1950s, we started to even figure out how to visualize DNA on a gel. And then 1967, we learned how we can glue two pieces of DNA together. And then how do we cut? And then how do we start reading? So it took over 50 years to get to where we are now, where now we only just started with that basic set of instructions that we could have done, with, um, that a microchip could do. And this is definitely on the DNA level, and from the DNA level, we can start building on new functionalities and technologies. So the beauty of now is that we can start thinking of biology as a technology, right? We, a lot of people have talked about using DNA, kind, it's similar to code, and mixing and matching that so that we can actually build technologies out of biology. And instead of just thinking about medical devices and therapeutics, biology can be a technology for all different sectors of society, such as food and agriculture is a big one, consumer biotech, neurotech, biodata, industrial tech, and then of course our medical di devices and biopharma. And the interesting thing is that there's so many more applications yet to be discovered and we're really excited to, to learn about what those could be. 
So there are some driving forces that cause biotechnology uh, entrepreneurship to actually start um, in, in, in these last few decades or in the last few years. Um, one of the, one of the uh, forces is actually called the postocalypse, if you've heard of this. This is where basically there's not enough um, professorship positions and you know the grant money is very limited that people PhDs who are you know well trained end up going for postdoc after postdoc after postdoc and there seems to be no end to that um, so this gives us a huge amount of talented people who don't know what to do with themselves and so we, it would be great if we can redirect their efforts into starting their own companies there's faster science being done. Of course, with Moore's Law and all the technological innovations, we now have bioinformatics. We can you know, sequence DNA, write DNA um, much, much faster. Um, and then that, coupled with that is experiments are coming to becoming cheaper. Um, equipment is becoming cheaper. Reagents are more accessible. There are um, contract research organizations that you can, you can send out your work, such as cloud labs that you can do your work on. Um, so that, that all really, all of these three um, factors is really driving why right now is a great opportunity to start a biotech company. And so that was the thesis on which um, IndieBio was founded on. We had a hypothesis about two and a half years ago to build an accelerator program to help train scientists into entrepreneurs and teach them about how to start companies. Um, and so that's what ba the basis of what we do. Um, and we have four, uh, we do a, a four month startup accelerator program. It comes with 250K in funding, which we take equity in. And we have a fully um, equipped biotech, biotech lab. And this is one of the most important parts because in biotech, if you don't have a lab, oftentimes you don't have the resources to start your company. Uh, so then it becomes a chicken and egg thing because everyone re wants you to have a prototype, but you can't build your prototype until you have some money to start your lab. So um, this really helps by uh, using a shared lab to have these companies uh, work through and develop their, their initial prototypes. Uh, our program also has over 200 mentors, and we're located in downtown San Francisco, so at the heart of Silicon Valley. And that is um, you know, following a lot of the, the, um, the tech entrepreneurs and the tech VCs. We're kind of redirecting a lot of those efforts into, um, into biotech. So I mentioned kind of the different segments that we've invested in and that we're very excited about. I'm going to go through some of the companies that we've, we've done um, in these different um, categories. Um, so one of the probably most noted ones is called Memphis Meats. This meatball here is actually made from stem cells. Um, so this company has done this for pork, beef, chicken, and uh, duck so far. And so this movement is called cellular agriculture or clean meat because not only is it a humanitarian thing or an animal rights thing where we're not slaughtering animals and you know, moving away from factory farming, but also it's clean because there's no antibiotics, there's no you know, contamination in our food. Um, so while currently it is still very, very expensive to do this in the lab, over the next few years we should see this being relatively similar to what you would buy from a, a restaurant. So that's very exciting for meat and potentially vegetarians. <laughs> um, another really interesting area in the food sector is actually breaking down foods to their molecular level. Uh, so this company, Ava Winery, was started by two guys who went to Napa and saw a really, really expensive bottle of wine and said to themselves, we're never going to be rich enough to drink that wine. And it's like, but wait a second, wine is just a bunch of molecules, so why can't we recreate that wine? So that's exactly what they do. They take wines, they throw it in a mass spectrometer and I, I analyze the different components and their concentrations, and now they're putting them back in their, their correct compositions, right? So now this is like pennies on the dime, and they can make essentially whatever varietal or whatever wine you, you would want. And the fascinating thing about this is we're now looking at food from not just the, the, you know, the, the food itself, but we're looking at it on the molecular level. And that when we change small, the molecules, we can have different properties. Uh, we can, you know, in, in the case of wine, we can eliminate sulfides so that you don't have hangovers as much. Um, so this has a lot of promise in the future of developing new types of foods um, that we can work with. 
Um, going into consumer biotech, this leather here is made from mushrooms. Um, mycelium actually create this collagenous fiber and you can grow them into sheets. Um, and it's really nice because you can also grow patterns. So you can't grow a cow with, with different kinds of patterns, but you can do this with, with the mushrooms. Um, this, this particular mushroom and this, that this particular company, Microworks, has made um, it feels amazing, just like real leather. And they've shown that a, with a full cow's hide piece of leather, which normally takes two years to grow because you have to feed the cow and the, grow, the cow has to grow up, they can make that in two weeks. So think of the fraction of the cost and the environmental impact that that saves uh, for having these kind of new leather products available. In Neurotech, one of the companies that's, that's kind of f far out there, but um, extremely interesting is Neurocomputation. This company, Neuro, uh, Hanaku, has a chip where they embed the uh, neurons in different formations so that the connectivity can essentially, you can do computation on that. Um, so this company is um, yeah, going ahead and hopefully in the next few years making the first brain, the first bio brain computer. Uh, from a data side, uh, this company called Catalog is storing archival d uh, data, digital data, into DNA. And why would you do this? Well, for one, DNA is actually a million times more dense than flash drives, which is the currently most dense um, form of storage. And of course, when you're talking about archival, you, you, right now it's done with magnetic tapes and they're in large facilities that have to be cooled, and actually every 20 years you'll have to recopy the magnetic tapes because they go bad. Well, with DNA, you, if you freeze it and dry it down, we know that we can store it for pretty much infin infinitely. Um, there was actually a case where um, there was a 60, thousand-year-old um, mammoth that was uncovered, and they uncovered the DNA from that. So it's very likely that we can store the DNA for a long, long time. And then lastly, DNA can be copied very, very easily with a well-known technique called polymerase chain reaction. So within two hours, you can essentially copy your entire petabytes of data over. Um, so uh, this is very exciting for the future of storage. Um, another company in the kind of bio data space is called Scaled. So you can imagine entire laboratory work, worth of work done in a microfluidic chip. And this chip houses 80,000 different experiments running at the same time. It uses different combinations of molecules to test the different conditions. And what you can use this for is for stem cell differentiation. Uh, stem cells differentiate at a very specific condition. And by using the screen, this company has actually shown that they can make a kidney organoid. So basically a small set of cells, and actually 27 different types of cells um, as a kidney. And, uh, and using this technology. Um, so this, the kidney, of course, can then eventually be made potentially into full kidneys, but can also be used for drug development, drug screening, et cetera. Going on to industrial biotech, we have a company called Yuba Biologics, which is reclaiming coal mining and gold mining water. Uh, so the, obviously the runoff from these processes is very toxic. There's high amounts of sulfide in it, and they've found a cocktail of microbes that can purify the water and put it back into the lake. And medical devices, um, this one is called Knox Medical, and uh, it's a spirometer for, for measuring um, your breathing for kids with asthma. So the idea is the kid would blow into this every single day and you would be able to see the changes in their lung capacity. And this way you can actually predict when a asthma attack might happen days before it happens so that the, the uh, parents can help medicate the kid. And then last but not least, I want to mention um, we have a lot of pharmaceutical, pharma, biopharma companies, a lot of them in cancer. This particular one actually works with snake venom. Uh, if you guys don't know how snake ve anti-venoms are currently done, you actually have people going and milking a snake, and then, the, then they take the snake venom, inject it into a horse, and then they, they lyophilize, they dry up that horse serum. So if you got bit by a snake, you get rushed to the hospital, you hope that that hospital has that venom, you hope that you remember which snake bit you, because it's very specific, and then if they had that anti-venom, they inject horse serum into you. 
Um, so this is a very kind of archaic practice. Um, horse by horse, there's no QC there, um, so it can vary. <laughs> and, and also you are injected with a whole bunch of horse blood, so oftentimes people have anaphylactic shock to the horse blood itself. Um, and of course this is, um, this is an area where, you know, kind of the developing world hasn't paid a lot of attention to because we don't have that many snakes, and, um, but of course in Southeast Asia and Africa, that's, it's a huge problem. Lots and lots of people have to, you know, cut off limbs because of the, the, um, the snake venom starting to eat away at their limbs. So what this company is doing is using more pharmacological advancements uh, in the development of antibodies um, to address this issue. And so one thing they did is they mapped out, well, what are all those different kinds of snakes, snake venom, anti-venoms, or the molecules um, in, an, in a region, and they have a cocktail solution so that you have 99% coverage of a snake bite. So it, it like 99% of different species will be covered in this one shot. And furthermore, the shot, instead of rushing to a hospital, you can actually bring the shot with you. So you can imagine if you were going to Southeast Asia, you're going to go into the, the jungles, you can bring the shot with you. And if you accident, accidentally get bitten by a snake, then you can inject yourself immediately and stop that, um, the progression of that, anti, um, that uh, you know, degradation of your limbs. <laughs> so, so how do you get involved in bioentrepreneurship? Um, if you're thinking about starting a startup in the future, or you're just, you know, early and thinking and dabbling in the space, um, some suggestions is engage in communities. Um, obviously, this by the biohacking village is an amazing community. Defcon is an amazing community. Uh, there are a lot of ha biohacker spaces around the country and around the world now that you can engage in. And then, furthermore, I. I you should engage in sci with scientists and talk to people in the particular fields that you're interested in, see what their pain points are, see what, see what um, kind of novel ideas come out of that. Definitely find a co-founder. Um, you know, sometimes in, in, in um, software you can g get along with just being your own co uh, being your own founder, uh, but in biotech you definitely cannot because um, usually we advise that you have one scientific lead and one technical lead. Uh, or sorry, one scientific and technical lead and one business person. Uh, there's just way too much to do that you definitely need some co-founders to help you in the process. And in general, you know, with the, East, the maker ethos, tinker, make, try, uh, I don't advise trying things on yourself, but <laughs> do try and on other experiments, other organisms first, um, you know, in an ethical manner. <laughs> And then um, don't be afraid of failure, of course. Um, you know, biology is an extra level of difficulty where sometimes nature doesn't allow things. Um, so things will fail, definitely, but keep persisting. And you know, that's why PhD programs are like seven years now. Um, so you can, if you continue to pr progress and learn from mistakes and, and you know, try and pivot, uh, there will be ways uh, to, to make a success, successful startup. And then if you are thinking about venture funding, um, which not all companies have to be venture funded, um, some of the things to consider is that you do need some kind of technical insight that gives you an unfair advantage. So often this is called the IP. Um, oftentimes you don't have to start off with an IP in order to, to apply for venture funding, but you have to have at least have a roadmap to how you would gain IP. Uh, how do you make that insight and that IP into a product? Obviously, science by itself is not a product, so you have to figure out what the product is, who's going to use it, who would actually buy it. And then furthermore, how do you turn that product into a sustainable business, whether that be you're selling a razor blade model or you have one product that, that follows with multiple other products later. Um, so figuring out that, that, um, that dynamic and how you would grow your business. And then lastly, with venture capital, we always think of how you, it has to have a big impact on the world. So how would your business potentially touch a billion people in the world? And you know, that's ultimately what we really want to do is we think that biotechnology is so impactful. It is one of the technologies that can scale relatively easily because it is grown. Um, and so we, we want to make an impact in the world. So if you have any qu questions, um, I can take them now, but I, I, um, you should check out our website and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions. <laughs>